Thank you. The Assembly Committee on Government Affairs will come to order. If I could have our committee secretary, please call roll. Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Black. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Ellison. Present. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblyman Matthews. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblywoman Thomas. Assemblywoman Torres. Chair Flores. Present. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And um, I don't know if we heard Assemblywoman Thomas, but I do see that she is present. I can see her on the Zoom. Yes. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, good morning, members. I hope everybody had the opportunity to see family over the weekend. Um, even if it was just virtually, it's important that you, uh, you, you always do that. Um, this building can uh, become very difficult at times with our family, so it's important that we're always working with them closely and reaching out. Don't forget about your health. Um, I want to remember. I want to remind those of you uh, following us virtually um, that all of us have a very unique setup in our own office. Uh, particularly to those presenting, uh, please know that if we're looking in different different directions, it's just because everybody has a unique setup in their particular office, but we are following along. Uh, I also want to remind folk wishing to participate uh, that we will be having public comment at the end of the meeting. Uh, you can call us in and then uh, you'll get on in line and depending on how many folk call, just uh, we don't necessarily take them in any particular orders just as they come in. Uh, we allow two minutes for public comment. Members, I want to remind you to please uh, keep your microphones muted uh, unless you're speaking and that your cameras remain on. With that, uh, we have a relatively short uh, agenda for this morning. We have two presentations, one from our Secretary of State's office and the second from the Office of the State Treasurer. We're going to take it in the order it appears on the agenda itself. And with that, I'd like to open up the presentation from the Office of the Secretary of State. Uh, Madam Secretary of State, good morning, welcome. Good morning, Chairman Flores and committee members. Uh, uh, for the record, my name is Barbara Sagaski. I am the Nevada Secretary of State, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today. So I'm going to get started, and um, we'll tell you a little bit about our office. And if you have any questions, I have my entire staff here, all my deputies, uh, to answer any questions you might have about any particular area. And uh, Chairman Flores, I do want to say that um, my deputy, Gail Anderson, has had the pleasure of working with you on many issues, and I want to thank you for your service uh, to our, our uh, state as well. So joining me from Carson City is Scott Anderson. He's the Chief Deputy of Secretary of State, and also present with me are Deputy Secretary for Commercial Recordings, Kimberly Perande, uh, Deputy Secretary for Elections, Mark Belashen, Deputy Secretary for Southern Nevada, Gail Anderson, and Deputy Secretary for Securities is Aaron Houston. The Office of the Secretary of State is one of the original constitutional offices established in the Nevada Constitution. It is responsible for maintaining the official records of the acts of the legislature and the executive branch. Additional duties have been added over time and range from Chief Officer of Elections to Recorder of Business entity, entity Filings to register of notaries public and to administer of uh, to administrator of the union of the uniform sorry uniform securities act to administer of the uniform securities act the silver flume business portal and document preparation services nevada lockbox and domestic partnership programs the secretary of state serves on a, a variety of boards and commissions and you can see them listed um, on slide three. 
the election integrity task force is something that we've taken from um, the previous, my predecessor, Ross Miller, and it has, it is something that we not only work with national law enforcement, but also with all the state law enforcement. It has proved to be very efficient and we do enjoy the integrity task force meetings. The Office of the Secretary of State is organized into eight main divisions, the Commercial Recordings Division, the Business Portal Division, the Domestic Partnership, Nevada Lockbox, Document Preparation, Services Division, the Executive Administrative Division, the Elections Division, the Notary Division, the Operations Division, and the Securities Division. Our main offices are located in Carson City in the Capitol Building, the Myers Annex across the street, and the Blaisdell building. We also have an office in the city hall building in North Las Vegas, normally in-person customer services, such as picking up forms or paying fees are available in both the Carson city and the Las Vegas office, offices. However, our offices have been closed to in-person counter services since the beginning of the declaration of emergency. And fortunately online and mail services have continued since that time and we have been able to serve our customers. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. I will now turn the time over to Scott Anderson to continue our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Scott, are you on? I am sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just unmuting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. For the record, I am Scott Anderson, Chief Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, we'll go into the office staffing. Uh, the Secretary, the Office of the Secretary of State currently has 144 full-time positions authorized. The number of positions assigned to each division can be seen on this, on this slide. Of the 144 positions that we do have authorized, 23 are currently unfilled due to the hiring freeze resulting from the budget crisis created by the state of emergency. The Office of the Secretary of State serves as the collector of various fees, fines, and penalties. These range from filing and license fees with the Commercial Recordings Division to broker-dealer license fees with the Securities Division to candidate filing fees with the Elections Division to fees relating to document preparation services and domestic partnership programs. The majority of the revenue collected by the office goes to support the general fund. In fiscal year 2020, the office collected revenue of $209.7 million. Of that, $209.2 million, or 99.8%, went to the general fund. This places the office as the third highest general fund revenue generating agency in the state. Slide number seven shows a pie chart breakdown by division of the general fund revenue collected by the office uh, for fiscal year 2020. As you can see, the largest general fund generators in the office by far are the commercial recordings division at 85.3%, or 186.2 million, and the securities division at 13.5% at 19.4 million. Together, the commercial recordings division and the securities division make up 98.3% of the total general fund revenue collected in fiscal year 2020 by the office. The remaining 1.7% come from UCC fees, the notary division, the Elections Division and the Document Preparation, Nevada Lockbox and Domestic Partnership Programs. Slide number eight lists some of the fees and penalties collected by the Office of the Secretary of State. The dollar amount or range of the fees and the statutory authority under which the office collects the fees. The Securities Division regulates investment activity and enforces the state's security laws found in Chapter 90 of the NRS. Duties of the Securities Division also include the registration of securities offerings, the licensing of investment advisors, brokers dealers, broker dealers, and athletes agents, performing compliance inspections and investigations, criminal investigations, and other investor, inve investor education. The Securities Division 
as, as I mentioned earlier, is the second highest general fund revenue producing division within the Office of the Secretary of State behind commercial recordings. Annual general fund revenue collections for the Securities Division totaled $29.8 million in fiscal year 2019 and $30.13 million in fiscal year 2020. The Office of the Secretary of State administers Silverflume, Nevada's business portal. Silverflume, which is designed to be a first stop shop for business to government filings and licensing transactions, supports over 500,000 business transactions annually. Silverflume's partners include 14 state agencies, 27 local government agencies, and 58 regulatory agencies. The Commercial Recordings Division is responsible for accepting, filing, maintaining, and providing public access to the organizational documents, excuse me, organizational and amendatory documents of business entities organized under the laws of Nevada. The division also registers trade names, trademarks, service marks, and rights of publicity, and is responsible for issuing the annual state business license to business entities. Business entities that are required to file with the Commercial Recordings Division include corporations, limited liability companies, limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships, limited liability to limited partnerships, business trusts, professional corporations and associations. Sole proprietors and general partnerships are required to obtain and maintain a state business license through the, through the division. The table on slide 15 lists the total number of business entities with active registration status with the Office of the Secretary of State. As you can see from the table, the majority of business entities on file with the office are organized as either corporations or limited liability companies. In total, approximately 326,000 active business entities were on file as of January 2021. Additionally, there were nearly 47,000 sole proprietor and partnership active business licenses on file with our office. The notary division is responsible for appointing, training, and discipline, disciplining notaries public, authenticating documents known as apostilles that are submitted by, excuse me, that are submitted to foreign countries in accordance with the Hague Convention of 1961 and for maintaining a list of qualified ministers in Nevada who have been licensed by the state's county clerks. The notary division also conducts training classes for prospective notaries public, including administration of online notary training, enforces the state's notary laws found in chapter 240 of the NRS, and administers the state's digital signature laws. Currently, there are over 25,000 registered notaries public serving the residents of Nevada. Since last session, oversight of the notary division functions has moved under the commercial recordings division. The Office of the Secretary of State administers programs for document preparation services, the Nevada lockbox, and domestic partnership registration. The Document Preparation Service Registration Program was created by Assembly Bill 74 of the 2013 Legislative Session. Document Preparation Service providers are individuals excluding licensed attorneys who provide assistance to clients in certain legal matters. The Office of the Secretary of State registers document preparation service providers, regulates their business practices, receives bonds, investigates violations, and authorizes disciplinary action and other remedies. Currently, 1,287 document preparation service providers are registered with our office, up from 87, 870, excuse me, just two years ago. The Nevada lockbox serves as a free online storage for advanced healthcare directives, such as living wills, durable powers of attorney for healthcare decisions, and do not resuscitate orders, and guardianship nomination forms. Once filed in the Nevada lockbox, these documents can be accessed online by registrants, authorized healthcare professionals, 
and family members when medical treatment decisions must be made by the courts in determining gar guardianship. As of fiscal year 2020, there are 1,000, excuse me, 19,445 advanced directives and 3,064 guardianship nominations in the lockbox. The office also administers the Domestic Partnership Registry. A domestic partnership is in, a, in Nevada is a civil contract that grants domestic partners the same rights, protections, benefits, responsibilities, obligations, and duties as parties to any other civil contract. The Office of the Secretary of State files and ma maintains all domestic partnership registrations and terminations. 877 domestic partnership declarations were issued in fiscal year 2020. The areas of the office that normally come before this committee relate to the notary division and domestic partnership, Nevada lockbox and document preparation services. Since the 2019 legislative session, we have, implement, we have implemented a new commercial recordings licensing application that includes online services for most of the office's business filings. As part of that implementation, the Silver Flynn business portal was integrated into this new system. Additionally, this new system modernizes the notary registration process and registry. Document preparation services implemented business entity bonds with tiered bonding levels based on the number of employees covered by the bond. Additionally, the Silver Flume, the Silver Flume Business Portal also created a new user interface that enhances the customer experience by simplifying processes that better and that better reflect the image of our great state. Silver Flume also gained efficiencies through the conversion of databases and the realignment of the Silver Flume and IT teams. The Secretary of State's office has no proposed legislation before this committee this session. However, we are monitoring various other pieces of legislation. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn the time back over to the Secretary to make any concluding remarks. Mr. Chair and committee members, that concludes the Office of Secretary of State's uh, overview presentation. And thank you again for the opportunity to give this overview today. We are happy to entertain any questions you and the members of your committee may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Hey, thank you both for your presentation. And uh, Madam Secretary of State, thank you for, uh, namely Gail, um, because uh, she's worked so closely with us for, for so many uh, years and uh, she's always incredibly receptive and responds immediately. So I just wanted to thank you for that amazing staff and obviously you as well, but um, particularly Gail, I know sometimes we have the opportunity to get to know her, but I mentioned her name more than anything so that the, the committee members here know that we have some folk we can reach out to and get an abundance of information from. Um, so thank you. Uh, we have several folk who are uh, have questions I'm going to take them in the order I, I received them. Uh, we'll start off with Assemblywoman Martinez, please. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, and thank you for the presentation. Um, so one of the things that you touched on at the beginning of the presentation was about the, the positions, um, that not all the positions have been filled. What are the positions? And the second uh, question to that is, how long have they been vacant? Thank you for the question. I'm going to turn that over to uh, my uh, chief of staff and also Mark Belashin because he also wears two hats. He's um, our operations person until our other person comes in. So um, Wayne and Scott, you want to you want to answer that for the assemblywoman? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the assemblywoman. Um, as with other agencies, uh, the, the pandemic has caused us to have to make some uh, budget budget cuts, and uh, there was a hiring freeze that uh, allowed us or uh, required us to freeze a number of positions within our office, as well as to meet the budgetary cuts that uh, were required. And those, the cuts are across every agency or every division within the agency, uh, mainly within our commercial recordings division, 
Uh, we have some in our elections division and in uh, the other divisions as well. Uh, Mr. Belashin can probably give us a better indication of the actual breakdown of those. Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Martinez. Uh, Mark Velashin, for the record, I'm the Deputy Secretary of State for Elections. Uh, previously, I was the Dep Deputy Secretary of State for Operations. Uh, in regarding to the number of positions, and I do have a spreadsheet that we can provide afterwards uh, that explains a little more detail, um, so there's not necessarily a requirement for you to, to write them down or try to memorize uh, all 23 positions, excuse me. Uh, but we do have, uh, again, as, as our Chief Deputy said, uh, there's two in our operations, uh, approximately seven in our commercial recording, primarily administrative assistance, uh, folks that work with customer service in the mailroom and processing. Uh, our IT division has a number of them as well, uh, approximately four as well that are frozen. Uh, we have one in our uh, portal division, uh, the business portal, Silverflume, uh, as well as two in securities, uh, one in our special projects uh, that supports document preparations uh, and domestic partnerships. Um, and then as mentioned, also Q and elections as well. Uh, the timelines for each varies. Uh, there, there have been some that have been frozen for some period of time. Uh, a lot of that relates back to when, when the pandemic first started and the secretary recognized the fiscal impacts to the states. Uh, she directed that we were to stop hiring processes in order to, to freeze these positions, which then came later in order to potentially save the money for the state. Um, but I will be able to provide that answer, the, the details of how long each position has been frozen um, uh, as soon as we're done with this meeting. Thank you very much. Looking forward to getting the information. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Um, next, we have a Assemblywoman Anderson. And, and I want to remind, uh, for those of you speaking, if you could please state your name for the record. I know uh, at times we have some of our staff who are only listening to the audio but are not following the actual physical video itself. Um, so if you could do that favor just to help them on their end. Thank you. Assemblywoman Anderson, please. Thank you, Chair Flores, and thank you, Secretary Zagaski, as well as Mr. Anderson for the information. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, I think it comes right around slide 10 or 11. It had to do with um, the business openings. Have you seen a decline in the renewing of licensures and or even applying for new business licensures because of COVID-19? Um, this is uh, Barbara Sagaski, again, for the record, uh, Secretary of State, and thank you for the question. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Kim Perande. Um, she is my deputy for commercial recording. So, Kim, could you answer her question, please? Certainly. Good morning, Kim Perande, for the record, Deputy Secretary for Commercial Recordings. Um, we... We've been kind of tracking this since the, uh, the COVID closures and, and impacts hit us. And we did see initially a decline, primarily because of the governor's extension on the late fees and, um, and not renewing. So uh, in the first maybe quarter or first and second quarter of last year, we did see a lot of late renewals. But um, in tracking it since then, it looks like the renewals are pretty stable. Uh, we still are, we had a significant revenue loss in last year as a result of COVID. It was approximately $10 million overall. Um, and the revenues coming in currently are, a proc or, sorry, <laughs> They are stable and they are matching last year's, but they still are looking lower than the previous year. I hope that answers your question. It, it does. Um, do we know like by a guesstimate of the percentage since that does impact some other areas of uh, policy? Sure, um, I do have a spreadsheet that I can share with the committee after the meeting that will kind of break that out for you. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you for thank the you. question, Assemblywoman Anderson and Kim Perandi. Thank you for responding. Thank you. Uh, next, if you could please have uh, Assemblyman Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, I've, I've got a couple questions and uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, my colleague uh, brought up the business, uh, you know, and, and loss of revenue, because uh, I'm all over the state all the time, 
I mean, our, our district is so big. But as I drive to these counties, like even driving from here to Elko, and you go through some of the, the different towns and see the amount of buildings shut down, that's got to have a large, large revenue loss uh, for the commercial part. And then I see the people that are losing, you know, their life savings because they have no revenue coming in whatsoever from apartments. Uh, so that's that's another big loss. And and I think when this comes out at the end, you're you're going to see uh, a big hit. Um, so I'm glad you did mention that. And I would like to see if I can get a copy of that spreadsheet when you do get that out. That was my uh, uh, number one was also is a notary. Is Are you still doing that online and the training online and uh, being able to file all your applications online to if you want to start up a new notary republic or whatever, or add it in your office. Thank you, Assemblyman um, Ellison. It's nice to see you and glad that you're healing well. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to let Kim respond to that because she does have the notary division um, over there. And I think the question to all of your answers is yes, but I'll let Kim respond. And as far as the business mm -hmm. declining, um, Kim and I noticed there was a, a report online about one of the other states that has, uh, I don't know how to say it other than have inclu increased their business licensing by 20 fold, I believe. They started at 3000 and have gone up um, unbelievable. So people are leaving other states if fees and those types of things are going up. So we have noticed a decline in that, but I'll let Kim talk about that. Kim, please. Kim Parandi for the record, Deputy Secretary for Commercial Recordings. Um, Assemblyman Ellison, yes, the, the notary application process and renewal process was uh, made part of our new commercial recordings processing system that's on Silverflume. So they do have the option of doing it online or still by filing it by paper. Yeah, I, I, I did have a uh, somebody contact me about a week ago and ask me that question. And, and I think that's great the way you're doing this, because instead of having to wait till there's a class, they can do it online, uh, get their credentials and, and, and do the right paperwork. So I'm glad you're doing that. And I appreciate that. Uh, the other thing I've got the last thing is uh, I noticed uh, during this cycle, there's a lot of election laws. Uh, bills that are out there have you have you looked at any of them and and i know you you can't make a comment on one or the other but have you looked at all these these different requests that are going to be uh, submitted uh, bdrs thank you assemblyman ellison again for the question yes we track all of them and one of the reminders that i'll give um, for my staff is we send a letter to all of you no matter what um, division that we're in, um, we send a letter requesting to talk to you or get uh, involved with you on any legislation there is. So just a reminder uh, of that, that we still do that every uh, session. But we have looked at all the bills. We've talked to as many as we can that will give us the information on what they're looking for, because as you know, you can put a generic title um, on yours. And so we only know about, I think it's 27 was the last count. There could be more um, coming up, but there are 27 in the state legislature that we know about. And then we're watching HR1 nationally. Okay. And you, do, you didn't happen to know how many is at the Senate, do you? I don't, but uh, Mark Veloshin might uh, know the numbers. I don't. We're just keeping track of the total. Uh, if you give me a moment, uh, some of it, I'll, I'll be able to count and let you know, or I can provide that information either in the chat or after this uh, this meeting. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, I appreciate that. And thank you, Barbara, and it's good seeing you again. It's nice to see you, Assembly Assemblyman Ellison, and um, good luck with uh, the continued recovery. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Assemblyman. Uh, if next we can have Assemblywoman Dickman, please. Thank you, Chairman Flores. And good morning, Secretary. Good morning, Assembly Woman. How are you? Good. Good. I just have a quick question. Um, 
I'm curious, you know, and I guess this was touched on a little bit in a way, but have we seen a decline in, in corporations in Nevada since the filing fees were increased so much during the 2015 legislative session? And also, have we seen declines in corporations in Nevada since, you know, the governor shut down the state? Um, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman uh, Dickman. I am going to turn that over to Kim Perandi because she knows the specifics and will be able to explain that. Kim? Okay, good morning again. Kim Perandi, Deputy Secretary for Commercial Recordings. Um, I would be happy to share with you, Assemblywoman, uh, an analysis of fiscal years um, numbers with respect to each of the different entity types. I was not here in 2015 when the fees changed, but um, we I do know that we are one of the higher states in fees. Our corporation renewal, or just the business license for corporations is $500. And for other entity types, it's $200. And then added to that would be the other filing fees that our office has just for the registration of their, their corporate paperwork and, and renewals. Um, so I, I'll share with you an analysis of the decline. Um, this past fiscal year, yes, we did have a significant revenue hit when COVID impacted the state. Again, as I said earlier, about $10 million. Um, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but that was the overall impact of that. And our numbers now are pretty steady with, with that same impact. So while we're stable, we are lower than we had been in the past. Thank you so much. Thank you, Assemblywoman. And next, we have Assemblywoman Constantine. Thank you, Chair Flores, and thank you so much for the presentation. My question is for Silver Flume. Um, what, if any, services are provided for business or entities that are having any difficulty registering? And if I can ask a follow-up, what happens to businesses or entities that do not um, register through Silver? Thank you so much for that question. I am going to turn that over to Kim Prandi. That is her area, and um, she'll be able to help you with those answers. Kim Perandi, Deputy Secretary for Commercial Recordings. The Silver Flume application um, has a, a filing flow that when you select the type of business that you want to file as, if you're a new customer or if you're renewing, we'll walk you through step-by-step step to each section and page to get everything that you need for that process. Um, if customer, and there has been some struggle with Silver Flume and our new filing system, I'm sure you all have seen that. <laughs> We're working on that. Um, but we do have 14 live customer service representatives that answer phone calls and will help walk the customer through the process. Um, and I'm sorry, I think you had a second question for me and I already forgotten that one. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Are any, I guess, a second follow-up. Uh, are there any of those live customer service reps that uh, speak any non-English languages to help with some of the businesses around the state? And then the other follow-up um, was what happens to a business or entity that does not file? Oh, right. So uh, yes, our Kim Perandi, for the record, Deputy Secretary for Commercial Recordings. Um, we do have some customer service representatives that um, also speak Spanish. So we can assist in that way. If there are other languages, um, we will ask for it in writing and then we'll see how we can interpret it and, and respond. Um, an entity that does not renew on time goes into a default status for a year. And then after a year, they become revoked. They do remain on record, however, so we um, it is a permanent record. You can see that filing history on our website. You can look up any business entity. You can see their filing history and you can see their status. Thank you. Next, we have our vice chair, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, building off of Assemblywoman Considine's question, I just want to understand what outreach and partnership the Secretary of State's office has um, with diverse communities, so specifically looking at like the booming Latino community, which opens a lot of businesses here throughout Nevada, and the AAPI community, which opens 
a significant amount of businesses. So what partnerships we've created with those businesses and those um, the, the, those communities. Well, thank you, Vice Chair, for that um, question. We really appreciate it. I also want you to know that we are members of um, many of the chambers and uh, we work well with them. And I'm gonna let Kim Parandi expound on uh, your question, if that's all right, Vice Chair Torres. And thank you for the question. Yes, thank you, Secretary. Kim Parandi for the record, Deputy Secretary for Commercial Recordings. Um, we do, as the Secretary mentioned, we are members of several chambers. Um, we also uh, participate in small business roundtable meetings with Department of Business and Industry. Um, we, our Silver Flume team does a lot of outreach themselves. And um, we also have a compliance investigator, both in Las Vegas and in, Re in Carson City, that uh, join a lot of different um, meetings and, and outreach events that, that go on by other agencies. Madam Vice Chair, I'm not sure if you had a follow-up question. So about how much of the team, I'm not quite sure. So if I could understand like how much of the Secretary of State's office, um, how many staff members there are and then how many people are dedicated to this work? Well, <laughs> as you can tell with our numbers, um, Vice Chair Torres, and thank you again for the question. And I laugh because we are very limited in our staff. And uh, Gail Anderson does a lot of the outreach uh, in the, um, she's my deputy for the Las Vegas. I'll let her talk about uh, the Las Vegas office. So I'll let her talk a little bit about that. We are involved in numerous um, events and we do send out some of our other staff to uh, uh, other events, but I'll let uh, Gail Anderson, my deputy in Las Vegas talk about that. And then I'll have Scott Anderson talk about what he does up in um, the Northern part where he goes uh, we do try to get out to as much as we can, but we have a very limited staff and we also have a very small staff um, for any designated um, uh, events. But I'll, I'll go ahead and let Gail Anderson from Las Vegas. And again, I hope it's OK. I keep forgetting to say I'm Secretary of State Barbara Sagaski when I answer these questions. So sorry, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Gail Anderson, Deputy Secretary of State for Southern Nevada. And I oversee the Document Preparation Services Program and then do also outreach in Southern Nevada. And as the Secretary has mentioned, uh, we are active with the Latin cha several chambers of commerce, the Latin Chamber, the Vegas Chamber, the Henderson Chamber, the Asian Chamber, the India Chamber. And of course, that's looked very different this past year. Most of the activities and events have been Zoom, online, uh, not in person. So we haven't had the physical outreach that we do usually have. And again, I'm based in Las Vegas, so I handle these things in Southern Nevada. In our Document Preparation Services Program, uh, we work with and have participated uh, specifically with uh, one or two different uh, Hispanic business groups at their outreach events. Again, we're trying to address particularly uh, the issues of document preparation service, tax preparation. I think we've kind of knocked the notario issue. Uh, we haven't seen that come up for quite some time. And so that's um, our physical outreach, our communication outreach. Um, our compliance investigator for document preparation services has been on the radio. I can't remember, remember the call letters. Um, Hispanic broadcasting, um, particularly addressing uh, tax scams, ghost preparers, uh, things for the public to watch out for. Uh, we participate as much as we can. It's been an unusual year um, this past year without the physical uh, presence and outreach at the events that we usually do. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Does that answer your question, Vice Chair Torres? Yeah, I think that that kind of touches on it. And, I, you know, I definitely want to understand and it, it might be a conversation that we take offline just so that we can understand like all that all of that outreach, because I think, you know, 
obviously reaching the Latino community is a lot more um, diverse than just per, um, dealing with notario fraud, although that's a big issue. I want to make sure that we're able to expand as many businesses in our community as possible. Thank you. And anything that you have comments or groups or anything, please let us know. Gail Anderson is uh, open as the chair has <laughs> explained before, but we'll be more than willing to help you with any areas that you feel need to um, be expounded upon. And thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Members, I don't believe we have any additional questions, but I wanted to give you an opportunity uh, to unmute yourself now if I accidentally uh, missed you. Is there anybody else wishing to speak that I accidentally missed? Seeing none, uh, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and close out the presentation uh, from our Secretary of State. It was great seeing you, Madam Secretary. Great seeing all your um, amazing deputies and all the work you're putting in. Thank you. Thank um, you. Then close out the hearing. Thank you. Uh, and next we have a presentation by the Office of the State Treasurer, um, Mr. Zach Coinine. I believe you are here ready to go. Yes, sir. Good morning, Chairman, Chairwoman Torres, and the rest of the committee. Uh, due to the limitations, I'm Treasurer Conine for the record, uh, due to the limitations of the system, we have a couple of people from my staff on, uh, but we've got other people waiting in the rings to uh, help us with answers if you have any specific questions. And due to the limitations of your treasurer, uh, Eric Jimenez will be running the PowerPoint presentation. Eric? Okay, the state treasurer has a number of statutory responsibilities. We won't go through all of them, uh, but they're on the page here. I uh, have the pleasure of being a member of the State Board of Finance. That's the group that's approved more than $600 million worth of affordable housing bonds. Also the chair of the uh, College Savings Trust, uh, which administers almost $30 billion worth of college savings assets. Now we've got a number of checks and balances uh, when it comes to finance. And again, for those of you I assume everybody uh, knows, but there's six constitutional officers uh, in Nevada. Two of them uh, are on this call today, uh, the Secretary of State and myself. We have one other financial uh, constitutional officer, that's the controller. And then we, of course, have the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the attorney general. We're all appointed to four-year terms, uh, and they all run at about the same time. So the State Board of Finance is responsible for looking at um, all financial matters before the state. We look at investment returns, uh, mostly those generated by our office directly or indirectly through our financial partners. We also um, look at banking relationships and the rest for the state. College Savings Board of Trustees, again, uh, myself and Enchi are the only non-governor appointees, and that's responsible for really managing those dollars that come in uh, either from our financial partners or making sure that we have the right investment uh, plans for all of our participants. The Executive Branch Audit Committee is a fun one. Uh, that is the six constitutional officers and one governor's appointee. And we look through different executive branch agencies, substantially similar to the legislative audit group, um, in order to look for efficiencies. And then, of course, the unclaimed property general fund transfer. What we do is we take in all of the money from unclaimed property. We'll talk a little bit about that later, pay off the expenses of the department, return money to Nevadans, and then the remainder gets swept to the general fund for operating expenses. We'll, we'll skip over regulatory authority because it's not that interesting. There's a ton of acronyms on there, though, and we'd be happy to talk about that uh, whenever. Functional areas of the office, there are five. We have our cash management division, debt management division, investment management division, college savings programs, and unclaimed property. And we can go into each of these. Cash management is one of the traditional treasury functions that's overseeing the state banking and accounting. Basically, if any money comes into the state, uh, that money is in our control. So it comes in, we invest it uh, in the interim between the time that we get it and the time we have to spend it, and then uh, we spend it. We receive, uh, we receive and deposit all public monies. We have all main depository and control disbursement accounts for 63 currently. Um, and what we do there basically is we've got different ledger accounts, but it all sits in one bank account. And that gives us the most flexibility when it comes to investing and making sure that we can return as much money as possible uh, to Nevadans. We're responsible for the accounting and distribution of funds relating to the tobacco, uh, tobacco master settlement. 
which is about $39 million a year, um, and we're responsible for the allocation of revenues from the lease of federal lands in Nevada. Cash management also oversees merchant services. So you just heard from the Secretary of State uh, about a system called Silverflume, which takes in and processes business licenses. All of the payments for Silverflume end up going through our office. So merchant services means effectively credit cards um, and all credit card relationships through the state go through our office. Debt is the other side of investments. Um, we'll talk about investments a little bit later, but we're responsible for issuing all of the debt uh, constitutionally and statutorily for uh, and in the name of the state, except for issuances by the Colorado River Commission, the University of Nevada System, and the Department of Business and Industry, which has a few types of uh, variable debt. Subsection 11 of that NRS allows the state treasurer to organize and facilitate state pooled financing programs, including lease purchases for the benefit of the state in a political subdivision. Basically, when the state borrows money in order to build the kind of things that we all like, like schools and roads and water systems, uh, that goes through our office. In 21, the state treasurer's office successfully conducted two bond sales uh, comprised of two series of bonds each. You can see some of the details there, uh, but basically $235 million worth of new money and new projects and jobs coming into the state of Nevada. Our investment division, again, the group that manages the cash in between the time that it comes in and the time that it goes out to pay a bill, uh, means that we're managing a series of different portfolios. They include the general portfolio, which currently is about $3.3 billion. The local government investment pool, which is a service that we offer for other local governments uh, here in Nevada. So if there's a school district, for instance, who wants some help managing their money, they can send it to us and we'll manage it at an extremely low cost. The permanent school fund, uh, which obviously is the corpus um, that then flows into the DSA. The prepaid tuition program, which is one of 11 programs in the country that allows Nevadans to pay today's rate for college and get uh, a defined benefit plan later on. Invest, which is a small program that works kind of like the LGIP, uh, but for a longer duration, and the state's pooled collateral program, which again is a protection mechanism that makes sure that when banks are holding uh, Nevada's capital, that that capital is collateralized and we don't have uh, fear of bank failures. Our investment division, you can see some of the details about the uh, performance here. I will simply say that the investment division typically is limited to relatively boring um, things. Usually this is where I'd make a game stock joke, but I know this is all on the record, so we won't, we'll leave that aside for a second, but really boring investments, right? So things that have a relatively high return for the risks that we're willing to take, which is relatively low. So we're looking at fixed income investments, things like treasuries, bonds, uh, not a lot of equity investment, uh, is allowed in these portfolios. You can see there, but I will point to, uh, the fact that we put out $58 million to Nevada agencies last year. So when an agency has money in their budget um, and it's sitting there before they can spend it, we invest it and then we return that money to the agencies. We are one of the few um, state agencies that not only pays for itself, but actually adds money into the uh, revenue stream. Our college savings division has a number of programs and the goal of the college savings division in a broad sense is that we help people plan for, save for and pay for college. College Savings Division has been around for a while, but we've really shifted the office to not just look at what the products are um, that we can sell to folks, right? Like prepaid college tuition or 529 plans, uh, which work effectively like 401ks for college savings, but also how we can reach people who maybe don't have enough money to put aside. How can we increase the rate of FAFSA completion? Uh, how can we make sure that people are getting access to the grants that they might be eligible for? Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, very few of our, mater our materials were available in Spanish. Now everything is available in Spanish. We've had a number of Spanish pe speaking people to the college savings team. We think it's important to meet folks where they live, especially during time of pandemic. Right. So we have a scholarship database that has more than 300 uh, scholarships available to it. We have a college navigator who works with Nevadans to help them through the process. And we have a uh, student loan ombudsperson that I'll talk about a little bit later. A couple of the programs we do offer is Nevada's prepaid tuition. Again, one of 11 in the countries. The idea here is that you pay today's rate. We invest that money uh, over time. And when the child is ready to go to college, um, they've got it paid for. And there's a number of different plans there. Uh, one year's, two year, four year. Um, there's a plan where you can go to community college for two years and then two years at a uh, university level institution. A lot of flexibility there. Really great program. Uh, and the best people to talk about it are, of course, the uh, tens of thousands of Nevada families who have used it 
and found themselves ready for college when their child was very young. We also have 529 College Savings Account. Uh, we have one of the largest 529 uh, account groups in the country. We manage almost $30 billion of other people's money. That's not all Nevadans. That means that people from other states come here to invest with our programs because of how good they are. Pretty excited about that. Um, and the Governor Gwynn Millennium Scholarship, which has helped 143,673 Nevadans uh, achieve college that was set up 20 years ago uh, to help the best and brightest get access to up to $10,000 worth of tuition if they stay in state. We also have Nevada College Kickstart, largest program of its type in the world, 276,982 accounts, uh, and those are $50 kickstarts. Um, to children's college savings that they get when they enter kindergarten. We have our student loan ombudsperson who provides case management for student loan borrowers and education programming on student loans. That's both before and after um, the folks take out student loans that was passed last session due to a bill uh, by Assemblyman uh, Watts and Speaker Frierson. And our scholarship database, a comprehensive listing of scholarships and grant programs available to Nevadans attending higher education. That also started last cycle um, through uh, Assemblywoman Tolls. Our unclaimed property division claims uh, is a group that is responsible for receiving, reviewing, and approving or denying submitted claims. That's Nevadans reaching out and asking for their money. And holders is the other side. That's where we work with businesses who have a statutory responsibility to turn over unclaimed property. Um, for anybody who doesn't uh, or hasn't interacted with unclaimed property before, certainly encourage you to go to our website, nevadatreasurer.gov, search your name. Uh, you will find that you have some unclaimed property, I think, there's about seven of you on the committee right now who have unclaimed property. So I encourage you all to go check and maybe it's you. Uh, but the idea there is basically that the state is going to be around longer than any specific business. So if the business has an obligation, uh, perhaps a payroll check that was never cashed, uh, or a refund or something else, they give it over to the state to hold in trust. And we've got more than almost $900 million worth of other people's money held in trust. Now that money doesn't stay in an account, that money gets used for the general purposes and we manage the process of basically money in, money out to make sure that we always have enough money to pay claims. Uh, our audit division is responsible, and when I say division, I mean our audit functionality, it's a person and a half, is responsible for looking at companies working with outside auditors to make sure that folks are filing uh, the property that they're supposed to. Well, oftentimes businesses are unaware of their unclaimed property uh, legal restrictions. So we work with the Secretary of State's office and others to make sure that new businesses know what the responsibilities are. And also that businesses who didn't know about it can um, catch up, pay back their unclaimed property. And we try to avoid uh, penalties and fees on those who did it due to ignorance versus actual malfeasance. Fiscal year 21 to date, we've received about $61 million uh, worth of Nevada's money back into trust, uh, and we've paid out about $23 million worth of claims. Again, worth mentioning, the unclaimed property division pays for the unclaimed property division. The monies that we receive in pay for the staff there. In the college savings division, the college savings division is paid for by um, by the, the fees generated by our college savings partners uh, in debt. We pay for ourselves through the debt issuances, investments pays for itself relatively uh, obviously, and cash pays for itself through assessments. So we have a relatively small general fund um, footprint uh, at the end of the day, and we're, we're proud of that. Our Nevada ABLE program is a program that uh, we've had some real success with over the past two years, kind of focusing on it. And uh, we've got a bill that we're running this session uh, over in health that um, love to talk about at some point, but really the goal here is to allow people with disabilities to save and earn money without threatening the loss of state and federal benefits. So a lot of times, if you have a state benefit like Medicaid, if you get over a certain income level for a period of time, that can threaten that Medicaid. And what you end up there with is sort of a difficult cycle where folks who do need help aren't able um, to pay for things that uh, can't be paid for with Medicaid, like a vacation or uh, getting an apartment or living a life. And so ABLE accounts are really important to give people the access to things they need. It's a federal program, uh, but our office has increased it to about 805 accounts. Uh, and I'll, I'll fact check this, but when we came in, it was uh, less than a fifth of that. Um, so we've really been trying to push to help those individuals get the help they need. We have a couple of special projects that we've undertaken uh, over time. Some of these are a little bigger than others, but uh, during the last session, we started a pilot program passed through AB 466, which was a bill um, that we got done that basically created a pilot program for marijuana banking. Uh, happy to talk through that. 
Um, during the beginning of the financial crisis, we reached out to Dieter and started running manually. So our staff manually ran people who ran for, uh, who filed for unemployment through our unclaimed property system to return money to them. So far, we've returned more than $1.7 million to folks who had filed for unemployment. Um, they get a letter from us that basically says, hey, we see that you have some unemployment or some uh, unclaimed property money. Would you like to claim it? We'd like to automate that process so that we can get that money back even quicker. And we ran a series of economic recovery programs, uh, primarily sponsored through Coronavirus Relief Fund or CARES dollars um, through the March package uh, passed at the federal level. That included the Commercial Rental Assistance Grant Program, which helped uh, landlords uh, small landlords and tenants uh, in commercial properties get paid and stay in business. The Pandemic Emergency Technical Support Grant Program, which currently has uh, put out about $50 million and with a bill uh, that we hope to see soon coming out of the legislature, another $50 million, which will uh, make it the largest small business um, assistance program in the history of Nevada. And the CARES Housing Assistance Program, which with the additional monies coming in from the federal government um, passed in the December bill will be about a $340 million assistance program statewide. Now, all of those have great partners in Craig and Pets. We've worked with the Governor's Office of Economic Development and in CHAP, we've worked really closely with the Housing Department, housing advocates around the state, uh, Clark County, the Reno Housing Authority and the Nevada Rural Housing Authority. So it takes a village on all of this. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that these special projects for the most part were handled by a team of three people in our office. Marijuana Banking Pilot, we talked about a little bit, but happy to answer any questions here. Uh, anticipated launches in spring 2021, we put a bit of a pause on it um, due to the pandemic. Didn't seem like the right time to uh, be pushing an innovative banking solution. UP Dieter Initiative, we spoke about. Happy to answer any questions there. Commercial Rental Assistance Grant Program, we spoke about. Again, we'll just flip through these. Pets, pretty proud about pets. Uh, one of the interesting things about pets is that we wanted to make sure that we weren't sending out any fraudulent money. And so whenever there's a business that we have a question about, either myself or Director Brown or both of us uh, will call that business. We've spoken to hundreds of businesses directly um, because we figured you know, every, every fake business we could avoid funding was another real business that could get funded. And of course, our housing assistance program, uh, which again, $30 million of state money so far. There's another $124 million of state money on the IFC agenda for later today that we hope get passed. Um, and that's helped thousands of Nevadans stay in their homes. Now, all of these programs, I think, when you look at CRF spending, have been works in progress, right? And we set up the PETS program in about a 10-day uh, window, and it's been about a $100 million program. So it would be false to say we haven't gotten better at it over time. Uh, but we continue to look for ways to help Nevadans any way we can. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I will start off with the Assemblywoman Considine. Thank you, Chairman Forbes, and thank you for the presentation, Treasurer Conine. I have a question about the Nevada College Kickstart Program. It's a great program. Um, my question is, what is the follow-up for um, for kids throughout elementary school, middle school, high school, to keep that college idea in mind and to keep them sort of focused on maybe building um, the account? That's a great question. So the original intention of Kickstart, sorry, Treasurer Conan for the record, the original intention of Kickstart is to do just that, right? It's to get students and families paying attention to college savings. When they claim the account, we then get all sorts of information out of them. So because there's, um, some privacy concerns, right? The, the state doesn't have access to all of the children's records right away. We can't start emailing them, uh, but we can work through the school district to get them to sign up for Kickstart. Once they sign up for Kickstart, now we have access to the parents, we have access to the student um, through the parents. And so we're able to start telling them about the different programs we have, but also to get them in the system to think about college savings the way that it should be thought of, which is not a one-time decision, uh, but a commitment over a period of time. And so we work with the students both directly through the schools, we're able to work with them directly once they sign up for Kickstart to try and get them to open uh, other accounts where necessary, and in some cases where they don't have the money to open other accounts, to know that there are other ways to pay for school, to know that grades matter, because it can help them get the Governor Gwynn Millennium Scholarship and other scholarships. 
to know that they need to fill out the FAFSA to get access to Pell Grants and other federal dollars and to look for programs like Promise um, in Silver State that could also be effective for them, right? So Kickstart really is to try and get that initial incentive to tie in with our office and then it becomes a conversation over the child's whole life. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Uh, next we have Assemblywoman Anderson, please. Good morning, uh, Treasurer. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, really quickly thank you for all the hard work that you've done when it comes to the rental assistance programs, whether it's CHAP or also the uh, business assistance programs. Your office was right on top of it and working almost right away. So I wanted to first make sure that that was uh, stated, how much I appreciated that. And I have a feeling that's a sentiment shared by many others. My question though has to do with more the unclaimed property. If there is um, unclaimed property that has not been claimed upon uh, the death of somebody, is what happens with that? Is the estate told about it or is it the estate's responsibility to contact your office and or kind of in a connected way, let's say that something is in the unclaimed property and somebody does not want to take it on purpose. Maybe it's a disagreement with the person that has left it or with the company that is donating it to that person. How is that process utilized? And I hope I've made that clear, what I'm asking. Treasurer Conan, for the record, uh, thank you, Assemblywoman. Um, so twofold, right? One, the office is primarily a receptive office. So while we occasionally are able to go find groups of people, uh, for instance, every year around Nevada Day, our office runs a program to try and reclaim, uh, to try to reconnect unclaimed property with different groups. So we've done uh, 501c3s based in Nevada in the past, uh, this past year we did that Dieter and uh, unemployment insurance discussion that we talked about. And we also have ongoing programs for things like child support, right? So if, uh, if an individual owes child support in the state of Nevada and also has unclaimed property, we can claim that property on behalf of the individual who um, is due the child support. But outside of that, for the most part, it's a receptive business. So when businesses, when individuals reach out, they reach out through that. Now, often through the process of closing someone's estate, a search of unclaimed property is part of that process. Um, but the unclaimed property flows in the same way that any other asset would, right? So if there are living children, it likely goes to the children. If there's a spouse, um, if there's a will, it can direct where unclaimed property and other unknown assets go. So we work with the estate to try and figure that out. The cleanest unclaimed property is obviously if I lose a piece of property and then I go claim it, right? But a lot of times there are um, there's time involved, right? It's a safety deposit box from 30 years ago and the value of those contents, right? And so we have to work with the um, work with the claimant to make sure that they actually have claim to that property and make sure that nobody else does, right? In the case of say two um, siblings with one claiming them, we'll either make that the sibling who's claiming it, get the other sibling involved and div divvy up the property appropriately or get uh, releases from both. So when I say that I'm proud that our claims time is faster than uh, it's ever been under two weeks uh, on average from the time that people apply and the people that get it, please know that that's a combination of both, uh, you know, guy goes and gets his own property, which is relatively easy. And also guy goes and gets property from a long lost great uncle. Uh, and we've got to work through that process and make sure that the property actually goes to them. Now, when it comes to what if somebody doesn't want to claim the property, the property remains in trust, right? So from a just good old fashioned title perspective, let's say that, um, and I'm not this kind of lawyer, but here you go. Uh, let's say the property was owned by person A, uh, and then they had one child and that child had one child and their first child, um, right, as opposed to their grandchild, didn't want the property, didn't want anything to do with it. Well, when the, the child dies and the grandchild is left, it becomes the child's property um, generally, right, through through title and issue. So uh, we just hold on to the property in perpetuity. I will, I will say the property can be donated. So if the person didn't want it, they can reach out to our office and say, hey, you know, there's a box you can check um, that you want the money. I believe to go the permanent school fund, but maybe it's a distributed school account. Don't quote me on that, but you can have it go to education um, and we will happily forward it to that direction. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Next we have Assemblywoman Thomas, please. Uh, 
assembly woman, I believe you're muted. Unfortunately, Assemblywoman, I, I I can't hear you on my end, but it might be an issue just with me. Apologies for the interruption. This is Cindy with Broadcast. Uh, Assemblywoman Thomas, if you could try uh, toggling with the little carrot over the microphone um, in the corner, maybe try switching your settings on your microphone to same as system. What about now? Perfect. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Thank you, Broadcasting. Thank you, Chair, and uh, again, thank you, um, uh, Treasurer Conan. Just a, a, a quick question. Um, when you say the unclaimed property, um, how long does this property stay? Um, and if um, you do have a monetary property, um, is interest being assessed? And if interest is, um, does that go to the consumer or does it go to the state? Treasurer Conan, for the record, so a couple of different answers there. I appreciate the question. Um, one, when we get unclaimed property, that usually means that it's been dormant for a period of time, um, on average, about three years, right? So let's say there's a safety deposit box, and that safety deposit box has become dormant. What dormant typically means, and it's different for different kinds of property, but from a real broad sense, nobody has touched it. Right. So if you have an online banking relationship, let's say you had fifty dollars in a savings account and you don't and you log in. Right. But you don't move money in and out. That counts as touching it. If the bank reaches out to you at the address that they have and the uh, the letter doesn't bounce back. Right. Because you still live there. That counts as touching it. So the property doesn't become dormant generally easily. Once it comes into our property, if it's cash, it's immediately made into cash. If it's stock, uh, it's held for a period of time until we do a stock sale. And that's mostly from a brokerage fee standpoint. We don't um, turn around and immediately sell it right away. Uh, but we also don't hold on to it, right? So if, if there's a share of Amazon stock, uh, we sell it. When we do our next stock sale, we don't try to time the market. And that's for a series of reasons, but mostly to keep it fair. Um, and then the third bit is, is physical property. So if there was a safety deposit box, after we get a safety deposit box, the contents are cataloged, um, the cash is deposited as subject to NRS and our uh, regulations. And then we hold on to the property um, for about a year and then we run an auction. And the idea there is to basically convert the physical property into, uh, into cash, right? So that that cash can be held <coughs> for um, the person who's going to claim it. Now, that's not all property, right? So for instance, if we find anything illegal or illicit, that obviously gets turned over to law enforcement. If we find anything uh, that's dangerous, that gets turned over to law enforcement. If we find things, occasionally we'll find things that clearly have sentimental value that have no cash value. Um, military medals are a good uh, example of that, but sometimes we'll find like an old wedding picture or something. Um, and assuming that it's not a giant object, we'll keep it uh, in perpetuity until we can try and, and connect it back because obviously some things are priceless. Um, metals are usually easy because they have the person's name on the back. So that gives us a, a hint on how to find it. And our office goes through a fair amount of work to try and, and discover who the owner of that box is. So if it's at a bank, we obviously know, but there are places that have uh, safety deposit boxes that aren't tied to anyone's name. They're sort of anonymous safety deposit box places. And sometimes those businesses go out of business and we end up with some very strange things. Um, and we look through those things to try and determine whose property it is. One of the things, for instance, and I don't mean to go to a side chair, but unclaimed property is sort of fascinating. Well, at least to me and no one's cut me off yet. So uh, sometimes we'll get things like a stamp collection. So we got a stamp collection worth in the millions of dollars, right? Binders and binders and binders of rare stamps and plastic and lucite and the rest. And we couldn't figure out whose stamps there were. they were. And that felt awful, right? That was clearly the combination of someone's life work. And so we went through and we actually found an article written by a guy complaining about another stamp and there was a clipping of that article in and with that clipping we were able to identify the person's family and we found out that the individual actually had started to lose a little bit unfortunately control of his facilities as he got a little bit older and had forgotten about his stamp collection but we were able to return them to the man uh, and his family so that that division does great work and when i say that division i mean the like 12 people who are in that division do really great work your last question is how long 
uh, do we hold it? So we hold the responsibility in perpetuity. We hold the cash much, much, much less time. So every year there's a sweep of unclaimed property dollars back into the general fund that help pay for the things uh, that we all like, like schools and Meals on Wheels and help for folks. Um, but we maintain the responsibility to pay it out. And so what our office does is we work through the actuarial math that says, hey, we're going to get in about this much on average. We're going to pay out about this much. The office costs a little bit. And so what's the delta we're able to use for um, general fund contributions? There are also other things that come out of unclaimed property. Um, uh, there's a $7.6 million transfer uh, on an annualized basis into the Governor Gwynn Millennium Scholarship Fund. There's the cost of the office. And there's a bill um, that Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno is running to help us reform uh, grants in the state that would actually pay for some of our grants matching out of unclaimed property. Um, but we hold it in perpetuity. From an interest perspective, uh, interest does not generate on those accounts for the benefit of the recipient. That's for a couple of reasons, but mostly that it would be exceptionally difficult to figure out. The only thing I can say is wow, but thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Assemblywoman. If next we can go to Assemblywoman Martinez, please. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Treasurer Conine. Um, the question that I have is in regards to the defeating millennial scholarship. Um, what are you guys doing to, um, to save the scholarship? What's being done? Uh, Treasurer Conine, for the record, that's an excellent question. So let's talk brass tax real briefly. Uh, the Millennium Scholarship is insolvent with, we've been able to get one-time transfers uh, for the last couple of bienniums, um, thanks to the support of Governor Sisolak and Governor Sandoval before him and the work of the legislature to keep paying for it because it's an exceptionally important program, right? The Millennium Scholarship has been the difference between tens of thousands of Nevadans attending or finishing college and not, right? It's a deeply important program. With that said, it's very, very expensive, right? It's an extremely expensive program. And Senator Dennis is running a bill, I believe through the Education Committee, but it could be directly, that's gonna really look at all of the education spending uh, we're doing in the state and figure out how to right size it. You know, I think it's important for us to recognize two things. One, the Millennium Scholarship is deeply important. And two, it is probably too expensive. And so we need to figure out how to make it less expensive um, and make some hard decisions on that front. But I want to do it with data. I don't want to do it because we run into a budget crisis uh, and all of a sudden, and some states have done this, right, where they've had Alaska is a great example, where they had a, not to cast any shade on Alaska, very nice place, super sunny, um, but they didn't have enough money to pay for their entitlement scholarship. And so it just went away one day. So you had students who were planning to go back to school in three weeks and they found out that a big chunk of their tuition wasn't going to be paid for. We owe Nevadans a little bit better than that. We owe the legacy of the scholarship and the Gwynn family and the 20 years that's been out there and the hundreds of thousands of people who have been impacted positively by the program, something a little bit better than that. Um, but it's going to require a fair amount of work. And it's going to make, require some hard decisions. Um, we're in, we're all going to be in this one together. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a big ticket. Thank you for the information. Yes, it is. It's a very important scholarship. It'll change many, many lives for our, for our young students. Thank you, Treasurer. And members, I don't believe we have any other questions that I have listed here in my, um, on my end, but if I did accidentally skip somebody over, if you could please unmute yourself so that we can get your question on the record. I don't believe we have any other questions. Thank you members for your questions today and for your attentiveness to the presentations. Uh, Mr. Treasurer, thank you. Um, we look forward to working alongside of you uh, during this legislative session. Please reach out if we could be of assistance. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close out the hearing from our Office of the State Treasurer and broadcasting If we could please go to public comment. I wanna remind those of you wishing to speak in public comment that you please keep your comments to two minutes and that you remain respectful.
Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Um, well, members, I, I, I want to remind you that uh, tomorrow we will have a bill presentation. I ask that uh, you give yourself an opportunity today to, to read ahead of time and prepare any remarks. Uh, I don't anticipate that it will be overly controversial, um, but I do ask that you be prepared and we'll follow the agenda in the order that it appears for tomorrow. So we'll go through a set of presentations followed by the actual bill presentation itself. Um, and with that, uh, week two team, let's get this going. And again, thank you all for your hard work. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you.